We start off as a bandit. The only trace of memory I have is a bundle of bewitching branches, something tied to Mikola the Empyrean. The only other message I have at this point is the scar burned into my head, the symbol of the Mogwin dynasty. Luckily for us, one of its very members can be found immediately in Limgrave. He explains to us the classes of the dynasty. The first class is the Putrid Corpse, and you really don't want to be like these guys. They are basically zombie-like creatures who wander with no purpose but to wait for their lord. After this is the class of the War Surgeon, who this very man, Vare, belongs to. Then you can be promoted to the Sanguine Noble rank, and finally, the Lord of Blood. As promising as this sounds, I'm nothing but a bandit. I'm basically at the same ranking as the Putrid Corpse, so using the very item that drove me to pursue this pyramid, I bewitched Vare to grant me the rank of the War Surgeon. And just like that, I'm part of the War Surgeon class. The real mission is to now promote ourselves to the Sanguine Noble class. The two main factors to this are 1. Follow Vare's instructions on how to get an invitation to the dynasty, and 2. Steal the identity of an active Sanguine Noble. If you're wondering from a game point perspective of how I got the War Surgeon armor set so early, I was able to go to my main save file for this game and summon my friend to help me. I can drop off the set and then go back to my other save for this video. After using a nearby rune on the ground and selling all my armor, I can purchase a furl remedy from Kale and summon my friend to drop the set, which he did. We were invaded by multiple people during this process, which makes me want to ask, would you guys like to see some PvP content? If yes, let me know in the comments. Before I can start progressing Vari's requirements for an audience with the Lord of Blood, I must get stronger. This is done with your usual Elden Ring grind session, where you must travel around the entire map collecting a mass amount of upgrade materials for weapons, flasks, and level points. But let's talk about some of the important things I did here. Considering we are trying to make our way to the very top of this dynasty, any member of the organization is a threat, even the Lord of Blood himself. The first threat to eliminate is the Bloody Knight on top of Kenneth Hyde's fortress. Luckily, defeating him isn't too hard of a task. I kicked Kenneth off a cliff and made my way into the fort. When fighting this knight, it's the first time I experienced the effect of the bleed status in this run. The bleed status in Elden Ring is the very thing that the Mogwin dynasty worships, alongside Mikola himself. All weapons I would acquire in this playthrough would take advantage of this ability, which drains a percentage of your opponent's health when procced. Two of these bleed procs was all it took to defeat this knight and his comrade. The next target is the first bloody finger that you'll encounter. Normally this would be a hard fight to accomplish, but a nearby summon named Yura comes to aid soon after the fight starts. Together we killed another member of the dynasty. With this done, I can finally upgrade my standard dagger to the Reduvia. After this I killed Patches and then bought his crafting book for many foul feet, which would increase my rune level throughout the run. I honestly honestly needed as many runes as I could get, with the brutal item requirements and the future weapons I would use. Speaking of runes, with the bleed weapon equipped, we can also kill Grail, who drops a massive amount. These runes help me level up strength, dexterity, and arcane, because all of them are requirements for the next weapon I need. After collecting more upgrades throughout the map, I stumbled upon Raya. I bought her necklace back, gave it to her, and then went to get both medallions so I could meet her in the Altus Plateau. You can find her right after taking the lift, where she will transport you to the Volcano Manor. I needed to get here in order to acquire a somber 5, 6, and 7 smithing stone. Now that I'm in Altus, I can promote myself to the next rank, being the Sanguine Noble class. This can be done by defeating the nearby boss found at some runes. Honestly, this fight went so well that I didn't even get hit once. If you just spam the Bloodblade Ash of War that comes equipped with the Reduvia, this boss can't do much to stop you. Not only can we promote ourselves to this class now, but we can also get our hands in the Bloody Helike. Immediately, I cheesed the Knight's Cavalry boss for some free runes and upgraded it. If the plan is to continue Vari's steps to get an audience with Moog, then I need to prepare a lot. I wanted to have a plus 10 weapon before the encounter. Like I had mentioned, Somber 5 and 6 were easy to obtain in Volcano Manor. However, there was also a Somber 7 present. It's a lot harder to get this one as it's locked behind the Godskin Noble boss fight. I attempted a skip glitch that used to be very easy to pull off. That involves you making a precise jump onto a ledge. I experimented a lot with this, but it was such a hard skip that I figured fighting the boss would be even easier. To prepare for the Godskin encounter, I killed the Putrid Tree Avatar to get the damage reducing crack tier. I also acquired two Sleep Pots. With a plus 6 weapon, I was ready to take on the boss. Honestly, this was a fun fight without the other godskin enemy present. The bloody Helike didn't even deal absurd damage or anything but it staggered the boss and procced bleed. There were some close calls to the well-known rolling attack that this guy uses, but in the end, my build was enough to win. I used stone sword keys, got the somber 7, and went back to Caleb to pick up another somber 8 and 9. With all these resources, I could get my weapon to a plus 9, and I would later find a somber 10 in the Mogwin Palace. We need Godric dead to advance Vari's quest, and before we can get to him, we must fight Market, who is a spirit version of Moog's twin. This was a quick and easy fight, since I'm super overleveled for this part of the game. I was able to test out my new Ash of War. You can definitely definitely miss this attack if you use it when too far away, 
but if used correctly, this thing is insane. Mark it down. With another talisman slot acquired, I can put on the Pearl Drake talisman, making my somewhat ineffective armor viable. Godric is next, and honestly, this might have been one of the easiest fights I've ever done. First, I used my Ash Reward to progress him to his phase transition, where I then activated a bleed proc. This made him extremely low at the beginning of his second phase, where I then got a stagger, making the fight pretty much over. With this, I activated my first Great Rune, and then told Vari the news. This is where we can get a look at the Two Fingers, an entity that is unaccepted in the Mogwin dynasty. I reported this to Vari, and then took his request to go defeat Magnus. With Magnus dead, I can finally get to the Mogwin Palace. At least after I get my finger literally ripped off. Oh, good heavens. Clench your teeth, or something. What is supposed to be a massive dynasty of different knights is instead just a wasteland of putrid corpses. On the bright side, I can still get a lot of runes and a somber 10. Instead of meeting with Mog immediately, I thought it would be a better idea to go and continue Yura's questline, as it would eventually lead to Eleonora's invasion. Now, keep in mind that Yura is a rightful hunter of those in the Mogwin dynasty, so just to be sure, I wore different armor when speaking to him. I progressed his questline all the way up to the point where he can be found passing in a church of the Altus Plateau. This is where Eleonora invades but luckily I was able to get her to follow me through a tiny hallway and pretty much kill her. When defeated, she drops the Purifying Crystal tier, which will make Mog's audience much more friendly. And now finally, with all my upgrades completed, I can challenge the Lord of Blood himself. We can finally see him emerge from a pile of blood, in the exact location we will be able to enter the DLC. It doesn't take him long to realize that we are a threat to his power, and just like that, the fight starts. After making this video, it's crazy to think that I used to not like this fight very much at all. The first phase is quite easy and simple. Most of his attacks are somewhat predictable and easy to dodge. It's simply a game of ducking and weaving through his wide spin attacks and knowing where to place yourselves when he throws fire everywhere. Now surprisingly, despite Moog being the literal lord of blood, he can actually bleed. Just because he can use blood for offense doesn't necessarily mean he can use it as defense. Unfortunately, I didn't find many opportunities where I would want to use my Ash of War, only because I spent most time using either R2 attacks for a stagger or R1 attacks for a bleed proc. This did pay off though. I staggered him and then hit a bleed proc shortly after. Honestly, I had him very close to death before his second phase started, as I got even another bleed proc during his ritual animation. Luckily, Eleonora's teardrop does protect me from taking any damage from this transition. Still, this second phase does let him regain health and grow wings, and this is where things get crazy. I had two very near-death moments immediately at the start of Moog's phase 2. One really nice trick is to circle around him during his flame attack, and then charge an R2 attack, which lets me just avoid his following swing. Using tricks like this led to another stagger, nearly finishing the fight. After dodging more attacks, I finally defeated the Lord of Blood. With Moog defeated, I can finally reach Mikola. We may not be able to enter the DLC just yet, but for now we can promote ourselves to the final stage, the Lord of Blood. If you want to try this build yourself, just know that I purchased both items received from Moog's Remembrance and his robe. I then paired this up with an octopus helm after farming for about 30 minutes. I then took out a mausoleum structure to make use of Moog's Blood Bloom Incantation, which is a pretty neat spell. This is when I also grabbed the Dragon Communion Seal. I honestly felt like I was playing as an evil villain, as I easily grew more and more powerful. But I mean, I am cosplaying the literal Lord of Blood, so I shouldn't be surprised. Surprised. Speaking of being evil, we can also finally bury our communications with Vare, and it's honestly a pretty gruesome death. This guy helped a prodigy become strong just to see him kill his lord, wear his lord's clothes, and then kill him while wearing them. I grabbed some bell bearings and spent a bunch of runes to upgrade these as much as possible. As of now, I could only get both my spear and seal to plus six, but this would soon change as I made it to the capital. And speaking of the capital, the only boss in my way is the Draconic Tree Sentinel. I wasn't completely sure of how this fight would go since I still didn't meet the requirements for Blood Boon, but I soon realized that the Ashawar Amagwan's Sacred Spear is absolutely broken. It's called the Blood Boon Ritual, and though I don't love the moveset of the spear, I love the ability. This spear also has bleed and and fire damage, making it pretty much all I need to cruise through the next few bosses. Now that I was in the capital, I decided to kill Asgar for the Lord of Blood Talisman. Luckily, Asgar and his dogs were all caught by my ritual attack the second I stepped foot into the arena. It's hard to say if this was easy or challenging, considering my health was so low. I could also use the runes he dropped to upgrade my spear to plus 7. Next is Godfrey, and this was another extremely easy fight. I still dislike the basic movement of the spear, as it's incredibly slow. I did get hit many times, but in the end, this was another short and simple boss in the run. Now that I've got all my talisman slots filled up, it's time to take one last step into the sewers 
and fight another illusion of Morgoth's. This involves a very treacherous path that I'm lucky to have memorized from my Vike and Yura videos. Eventually, this will lead to a spirit version of Moog, summoned by Morgoth to prevent the Tarnished from getting closer to the Frenzied Flame. But as the Lord of Blood, I felt obligated to inherit the flame myself. This fight wasn't as much of an easy one as the past few had been. I had to rely mostly on melee, as my other attacks were just not that powerful. Although this is probably because we're both using the same exact weapon, which honestly felt very strange. However, I had also experienced a fight with the original Moog who is way stronger. This had refreshed my memory of the dodge timings of this fight, making things much easier. Honestly, I had a lot more fun with this fight than I expected to, and I was able to gain my final incantation, the Blood Flame Talons. This is one of the few incantations I use on my main save, simply because of how cool it is to use. On top of this, I can also collect the Erd Tree Talisman, which is nice to have. I made my way to the Flame of Frenzy, to see that Morgoth had used even more of his power to conceal it. If I could defeat the Lord of Blood, I could defeat the Omen King. Before the fight, I had got my spear to plus 9, so I knew it was going to be over leveled and too powerful for this fight. But seeing my blood ritual deal immense damage as he nearly killed me was so cool. Or right here, just when you think I've gotten a free bleed proc, I'm hit with a toxic splash. Something about the contrast between these two characters is absolutely amazing. I honestly wish this fight had lasted longer, as Morgoth is probably one of my favorite characters in this whole game, maybe even the franchise. After hearing my brother's last words, I finally headed back down to the Flame of Frenzy. Honestly, I'm confident this is one of the evilest builds I've ever used in any Souls game. I also activated both Morgoth's and Moog's Great Rune, finally reunited the twins. After making my way through the majority of the mountaintops, I was sure to kill Okina. Apparently, he has relationships with Moog, as according to the item description, Moog and Okina had encountered each other before. It seems that Moog must have been hurt by Okina's blade, which inspired him to basically alter Okina's soul. Pretty dark stuff, but anyways, fire giant down. I burned the earth tree using the flame of frenzy and then woke up in Faramazula. Earlier, I had collected as many sleep pots as I could for the godskin boss in the volcano manor. I think most people won't be surprised when I say this was by far one of the easiest fights I had ever experienced. This weapon, when paired with sleep, might as well have been created for killing these guys. I continued my way through Faram, making use of all my resources. Eventually, this led to the Drake Knight armor set. I figured since this was the closest set to the Mogwin Knight armor, it would come in handy later on, especially since I didn't have an insane amount of health. I would also like to mention that this is where I finished Alexander's questline to get the Shard of Alexander. Anything that would boost my Asha War was useful, and this worked. In Malekith's fight, I got a Stagger, which I could then follow with a ritual. It procced Bleed and practically skipped his first phase entirely. As for his second phase, I definitely had to try a little more, as he never stands still fast enough for me to use my ritual attack effectively. It didn't matter though. I know this guy's attacks well enough to defeat him. And, uh, then Gideon happened. I'll just let you guys watch this fight. Godfrey was pretty interesting considering I could summon Shabriri. I actually wasn't able to do this last time I got the Flame of Frenzy because I cured it beforehand, but honestly, I'm not a fan of the summon, despite having Moog's Great Rune active. I highly recommend summoning Nepheli instead, but personally, my favorite way to fight this guy is alone. I restarted the fight by myself and was able to kill the boss pretty easily. Now, instead of finally becoming the Frenzied Lord, we had to take care of one more threat, Melania, Mikola's Blade. But first, I had to kill Nile. Luckily, I could use the very thing that I started with in the beginning beginning of this run, being the bewitching branches. I was able to get both of Niall's knights to fight alongside me, and then, as usual, I absolutely wrecked his health bar with my Asha War. This pretty much ended the fight, as I only had to hit him a few more times afterwards. I activated the statues of Mikola and finally made my way to the Holy Tree. Mikola's Hallowed Tree. In order to prepare myself, I attached the Mogwin armor on, making myself the most powerful I could be. I won't lie, when fighting Loretta, I traded health a lot, but that was my plan. With this new armor, I could actually afford getting hit multiple times in a row. On the plus side, I think this armor looks super cool. But yeah, I was able to kill Loretta on my first try. Finally, it was time for the Lord of Blood to face off with Melania. This fight was complicated, yet I'd sum it up by saying this build is absolutely broken. I won't lie, I still died many times. Just because I dealt so much damage didn't necessarily mean I could guarantee safety for myself when using it. I'll speed up the final fight a little bit to illustrate my thoughts. As you can see, Melania's first phase is pretty mindless. Distance yourself a bit and spam your ritual attack. As long as you avoid her waterfowl dance, you should be good. During her second phase, you might take a bit more damage. Though this is coming from someone who does not know Melania's dodge timings very well. As long as you can tank or heal through most things, you can eventually find a spot to cast your spell again. And after doing this for a while, she'll use her flower attack again, where you can take a breather before finishing the job. She's an incredible boss fight in my opinion, though I don't consider myself very good at fighting her. Luckily, this 
build is just that powerful. Now, you might think this is the end, but no. Something felt off. Instead of burning the lands between down and becoming the true final Lord of Blood, I had something else in mind. During this entire playthrough, I had secretly been completing both Millicent's and Corrin's questline. I acquired the Mending Rune and Mikola's Needle. Instead of serving Moog, I changed Warship to Mikola instead. I cured the Flame of Frenzy and changed my attire. Finally, I disregarded my seal, killed the Olympies, and disregarded my spear. And just like that, I chose Mikola's side and brought a peaceful end to the story. The real question is, was it a moral action, or was it just Mikola's bewitching branch all along? It's up to you to trust him, but I'd keep your distance. He's a feared Empyrean who manipulates others into his command. Did I really choose the right ending, or was it just bewitching? We're all gonna meet Mikula soon, and I beg you, keep your guard up. Alright, so that was a different type of video, and I hope you all enjoyed it. Speaking of the DLC, I'd like to say that I'm incredibly excited, and also, I'm developing a build for Mesmer right now. I also have a Blyde video in the works, and many more. If you guys enjoyed this video, consider checking my channel out. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.